Greetings. Welcome to the seventh lecture in the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's series celebrating Native American Heritage Month. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the Culture and History Department. The title of today's lecture is entitled Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Racial Crises and Racial Equity and the Case for Reclaiming a Native Narrative. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the chat box on YouTube. Mr. Roberts has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his presentation. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker, Michael E. Roberts, whose Klingit name is Teichach Sin, is a member of the Eagle Moiety, Gooch or Wolf Clan, Coon Hit Flicker House of the Kuyukwan, the Kuyu Island people. He holds an MBA from the University of Washington and a BA in architecture from the University of Colorado. Michael Roberts has served as president of the First Nations Development Institute and previously served at its, as its chief operating officer. He spent five years in private equity and has worked at Alaska Native Corporations and for local IRA councils, primarily in accounting and finance. He serves on the board of First Nations Development Institute and is past board chair of Oista Corporation. He is also a board member and treasurer of the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders Network and a board member and investment committee chair of the $266 million Native American Agricultural Fund, the largest philanthropic organization solely devoted, devoted to serving the Native American community. His past service includes board positions for Native Americans in philanthropy and the Association for Enterprise Opportunity, as well as on the advisory council of the Center for Native American Public Radio and on the National Advisory Committee for the National Center for Family Philanthropy. Mr. Roberts. Hello. Thank you, Chuck. Can you all hear me fine? Cool. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm really, it's really an honor to be part of this series. Um, I'll tell you, the, uh, the idea of, of growing up um, in Southeast Alaska and, um, and, and now to see Clinket people doing this, um, it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, as Chuck, sh Chuck shared, I am um, Wolf Moiety. Um, and my, my family is from Kowak. My dad is from Kowak, but grew up in Ketchikan. And my grandfather, Peter, and my grandfather, Donald Roberts, um, grew up in Kowak. So a lot of family members there. Um, I, 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 I'm going to try and share a screen here today, but if I'm lucky at all. Um, and. Here we go. So this first um, slide, you know, one of the reasons I put this, this picture on this slide really has a lot to do with the, 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 the lecture today. Um, this improved order of red man sign um, stood above the, the apartment building where I was brought home to when I was in the hospital, came over to the hospital. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not coming across. It's not coming across, huh? Let me see if that works. How about now? Cool. So, um, and this, this sign is also the the sign that's at over the apartment building that my grandparents lived for the first twenty years of my life. But it really says a lot in my mind about my need for understanding the narrative that that natives in this country operate under 
in many instances, that narrative is defined by other people and not by narrative by natives themselves. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you guys today a, a short video, and um, hopefully it'll, it'll work. Which it doesn't seem to be doing. Oops. Well, my my uh, presentation might have got just gotten a little bit shorter because my my video is not coming through. Would you like me to share it, Mike? If that works, that'd be great. Thank you, sir. Indians. I feel real bad for is, is Indians. Welcome. Welcome. They get dogged openly because everybody thinks they're dead. <laughs> Indians don't talk like that. These are not all dead, all right? The idea of invisibility and non-representation is, I think it's a little complicated. Yes, they fought savagely, for they were a primitive people, and self-preservation is a primitive instinct. I think the representation isn't so much on Native people, it's how non-Natives view Natives. I live in a house. House. Not not TP, like a house. <laughs> As a native woman, we're very hypersexualized um, and romanticized. So I think that affects us in academics to just everyday life. They expect you to fit into this form that they would like, and when you don't, they silence your voice. When it comes to mainstream media, we have this one narrative of history, and but everybody, every culture has their narrative and history. That diminishes our youth self-esteem because they're like, what's the point? It seems like it's designed to to devalue us as Native peoples. If you never see a Native person portrayed as a human, a normal human, and you never meet one, 2% of the people are Native, every time I see them, they're on TV talking magic talk, then you don't see them as human. It's easier to perform a crime on someone that you think is not human. If you're always having misconceptions like mirrored back to yourself, then it's harder to get a grasp on your identity or it tells you that your identity is invalid. It's tough for me to even really imagine this system sort of valuing other cultures, I guess. When we see ourselves or our perception of what society thinks of us on TV or the radio or in mascots and whatever the case is that we automatically feel like we have to be in that slot like we're automatically seen as that and so might as well be that to add value to our people would be to have people involved as far as designing a society that we all get along in and that we all can share truths about each other instead of propaganda the worst that could happen is people would stop hating people for no reason and if that's all that happens by getting rid of negative stereotypes, that would be great, but there's so much more. I wonder if we need to get out in the world and actually have human conversations and ask people who don't look like us and don't think like us and don't live near us how they interpret the world. All right. Well, yeah, I, I definitely feel like education is important and I want my children to grow and you know get great educations. Whenever I was able to like get out and you know and learn and read and you know research on my own, it just it does make you resentful. It makes you feel like dang, like you know, should I? Can I even? Can I even trust y'all with my kids? Or, because there's so much left out. People are ready to to hear our stories. People are ready to um, learn about our culture it's by using story and injecting native people into story that humanizes them, that makes them just another person in a story and not stand out 
because their nativeness. Oh, it's really important that we work together for new narratives. We have so many opportunities and it's really beautiful seeing indigenous people be seen and heard and uniting with all of us, just telling our stories and sharing through our histories. So that, I just thought that was a, a pretty powerful short video, mostly because it, it really demonstrates what we're up against in, uh, as, as native people in this country. And it also shows that this is a pretty dominant narrative and one that wasn't created by, by us as, as native people. Um, and it really kind of sets out the challenge before us about how we, we go about creating a new narrative, right? And when we looked at this project, uh, as First Nations, uh, this reclaiming native truth. The, the big challenge for us was to, to help native peoples throughout this country create new narrative. But one of the things that we didn't know was what was the predominant narrative that, that Americans understood about natives in general. And, um, but, and when, we, when we started asking ourselves that question, it, it became apparent that we didn't know what that, that dominant narrative was. And if we didn't know what that dominant narrative was, then we're never gonna be very good at, at changing that narrative and creating a new one. It'd be like um, treating the symptoms to the disease, but not understanding and treating the disease itself. And so we, we, we been, began to, to look at what we needed to do to understand the, uh, the larger narrative and what it, what it might be. Um, we had some pretty ambitious long-term goals. Um, we really wanted to reframe and, and change some stories um, in the dominant culture. We, we felt that it was really important that whatever narrative we began creating or narratives we began creating, that they be asset-based narratives, not deficit-based um, narratives that we're so used to seeing associated with Native communities. And that we really wanted to create narratives that shifts hearts and minds. Um, throughout Indian country and, and Native American Alaska Native communities. But again, if we, if, we, if we wanted to understand narrative change, we really needed to understand what the core narratives are, but also who controls them. Um, and we started looking at secondary data sources to try to understand what that narrative was. And it was clear that this wasn't research that was out there. Um, and so, we found it incumbent on us to, uh, to do a bunch of research and, and a pretty deep dive into um, what that narrative was and, and realize that this work had not been done before that, that base level foundational research on the dominant narrative about Indians in this country hadn't been done before. Um, we also needed to understand you know, who creates the narrative that we understand now about Native peoples in, in the United States. Uh, and where do we see that narrative? And it was, uh, it's no surprise to us that the usual suspects came up, right? When people get their narrative about natives in their K through 12 public education and pop culture through media. Um, and we've had several conversations with folks at Fox and CNN and other networks about the way in which they do stories about Native Americans. Um, in political speeches, um, you know, Mr. Trump talking about Elizabeth Warren is Pocahontas um, from, from you know, outdated history books, usually in our classrooms, and even things like public art and statues and, and things like that. Um, I would include in this, in this conversation the mascots of, of professional sports teams. Um, so when you, when you ask yourself what's wrong with the dominant narrative, I think for us, um, the big takeaway here is that most of the existing narratives about natives in this country are controlled by non-native folks. Um, and as native people, we don't create or control our own narrative. And as a result, most of the narratives that we see about native people are, are negatively framed. 
So our goal was to uh, to shift the narrative, right? Um, again, we knew we were embarking on something that had never been done before, sort of like the uh, Native American version of Columbus, searching for and hopefully discovering something that was already there, that, that base narrative. But instead of the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, our three ships were research, research, and research. And why, you know, with my my bad sense of humor, I thought the three questions we should answer were: What makes a red man red? When did he ask you how? And when did he first say "ugh"? Um, instead, um, my team and the team that worked on this project thought that these were probably better questions. Um, like what are people's perceptions? Um, how do those perceptions differ through different segments of society? And what kind of narratives and messages can we create that begins to shift that that larger narrative? Um, though I do like the the Disney pop culture reference because I think it, those three questions really illustrate where many of us from a very young age have been indoctrinated into a negative narrative about Native people. But that one from from Peter Pan, the Disney version. Um, so, as I shared with you, we did a pretty deep dive into um, doing some research, and, and it was pretty exhaustive. We did a couple of um, literary searches, um, some focus groups, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, a bunch of interviews with, um, we call them cultural elites, so um, people in philanthropy, academics, um, political folks, judges. Um, legis legislators, and senators, congressmen. Um, we did some national polling where we actually had um, polling companies who've gotten kind of a bad rap in these last couple of presidential elections, but really are good about understanding public opinion. And then we worked with some researchers um, to do some national surveys and even did some, some interesting, they call it using social listening tools. So we went and had um, some folks who go out and, and, and crawl through the web and look through things like Twitter and Facebook and, and, and trying to find references to natives in, in conversations and, and find out what, what those conversations are. Um, and so a lot, a lot of work, right? And you can see the bad numbers here quite a bit. I, I will say for me, um, during this work, some of the most infuriating work that we did was these focus groups. I mean, it's one thing to, to suspect what people say about natives when natives aren't in the room um but when you're actually able to watch these focus groups you have you know 10 or 12 people in the room talking about subjects around native identity and and you know what people believe about natives um it's pretty disturbing what people say when they think they're in a safe place where they can be full-on racist and um there were times when we wanted to kind of crawl through the camera and strangle people because it was, it was pretty it was pretty ugly but but also very informative i mean i think that people have some very strong views of of in the way in which they define natives in this country and um you know our, our job wasn't to persuade them differently right now our job was to understand what that narrative was and try and move forward and, and change that I, I'm gonna try and go through these somewhat quickly, but the one comment I want to make is in many instances, the findings that we, we, we had from this research, they weren't big aha moments. They were, in many cases, they were very confirming um, that, you know, as I, as I run through these slides, I think many of you will go, oh yeah, I knew that. But for us, in order to understand what the base narrative was, it was as, as important for us to confirm what we thought we already knew as, as well as, trying to find moments of, of unique and nuanced learning in that core narrative structure. So the first one, the first finding, you know, no surprise to many of you, um, that in many instances, natives in this country are only thought about in the past, in history, and, and not well-written history, or not at least racially fair history, and rarely are natives thought about in the contemporary. It's very rare you have TV shows like Northern Exposure where they, where the Clingets bring their, um, their MBAs and their lawyers to negotiation with, um, with the town elders. I mean, I, so I think that it's very rare you to see Indians being contemporary society. 
And, and from our perspective, it, you know, as we'll see later on, that's an important part of, of what we need to do to change the narrative, right? Um, again, not another surprising one, but um, oftentimes natives are, are seen in um, a negative narrative that we only get to see the deficits that happen in, that happen in native communities. Um, and if we get to a, a little bit more time in the end of this lecture, maybe the question and answer stage, we can talk a little bit more about the way in which native organizations and, and native peoples perpetuate some of these negative narratives as well. Um, you know, First Nations are the grant making organizations. We read proposals all the time from native communities. And oftentimes the, the lead paragraph talks about the deficits of the communities that um, these folks are hoping to get us to fund. So I, I think that there's a, there's work to be done on our end as well as the people. And not to blame the victim here, I just think that there's opportunity for, for change and, and for improvement as Native folks as well. Um, there's, a, there's a real issue with um, the, the, the uniqueness of Natives in this country. Um, not an issue, but you know, for not an issue for us, but an issue for for folks who for non-natives who who see us, they see us wanting to be culturally different and culturally independent, and whether that's from um, our unique position as not being immigrants or because of the distinct political and geographic isolating isolation placed on us by the U.S. government, um, you know, pe people don't see us as wanting to be. Part of the, the great American melting pot, and, and you know, oftentimes accuse natives um, in, in their description of us as not wanting to be um, Americans. And uh, I think that's you know, whether we like that or not, it's a real part of the narrative that people believe about natives in this country. And they also, you know, believe that um, we are a pretty homogeneous group. You know, 575 unique federally recognized tribes in this country including you know, more than 200 Alaska Native villages. Um, you, know, you and I, as Native folks, know that um, Clinkets and Choctaws are as different as French and Irish. But um, as, a, as a whole, America doesn't believe there's a distinction between tribes and, and bands. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, you know, I think uh, as Native people, we or many of us are, are very familiar with tribal sovereignty. You know, that um, the American Indians and Alaska Natives are, are one of the three sovereigns named in the US Constitution. You know, the federal government, state governments, and, and tribal governments are, are all identified as, as sovereigns, but people don't understand the idea of sovereignty. Um, the reason I, I chuckle when I talk about this part of the, the presentation is I'm reminded of George W. Bush's quote about sovereignty and I, I can only you know kind of look back and chuckle because I, I thought that at the time this was the most uninformed president we, we've ever had in this country and um, he, he, might have, he might be taking a distant second now but George W. Bush's quote on sovereignty went like this tribal sovereignty means that it's sovereign you're uh, you're uh, you've been given sovereignty and you're viewed as a sovereign entity um, I mean, so we, we talk about the, the highest office in the land and really doesn't understand the idea of tribal sovereignty. I think that was reflected well in our research that Americans as a whole don't understand tribal sovereignty either. Um, we, we, we also found that people who live near native communities um, have, have a slightly different view of natives, both good and bad. And, and but they also feel like they're highly informed about and can speak for natives and speak on behalf of natives and, and inform others about the, the, the way Indians and natives really are. Um, and that was, that was a pretty interesting finding from us. Not that it was new or novel, it was one of those confirmational things. Um, we also found that um, people also hold conflicting opinions that you can, as a person, hold two different diametrically opposed kind of sentiments. And in, in the case of natives, um, that, that, that rang true. Um, people felt that on one hand, natives were impoverished 
On the other hand, the natives were getting rich from casino gaming, or that natives were highly spiritual and cultural people, but also when they were in or near Indian reservations in the United States, they, they saw the poverty and, and thought that these same natives were morally bankrupt. And that, that's an interesting proposition when you're trying to figure out how to change some of these narratives when people hold conflicting ones. Um, but I think some of the ahas here for us was that there were real paths for change, really. Um, and that you know some of the findings were, were encouraging and we found some unlikely allies. Um, one of the things we heard repeatedly um, the, on the public polling and the national research and, and the surveys was that people were pretty disappointed in, in the, the history lessons they received in their K-12 education about Indians and, and were really asking for more. Right, and, and and in our mind, that's a that is a relatively easy fix. We could we can reprint history books. We can you know help recreate classroom curriculum. In, in, in my mind, if this is what people are yearning for, um, as natives who are interested in changing the narrative, this is this is prime time real estate for us to to look at in order to to make narrative change happen. Um, you know, some of the unlikely alliances, one of the things we found in our research was 70% um, of millennial women were opposed to the use of Indians as mascots in professional sports or in sports in general. That's a big number. And that's a, and as a, a kind of an invisible ally group that we didn't know was there. And, and we think not only does that have implications with regard to the mascot issue, but um, with other consumer product issues, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later as we get to the question and ask stage. I'll, I'll show you an instance where um, we think that that had that had an effect on a particular brand. So again, all this work on the research part was to understand this base narrative, and I, you know, this is you know, as, you, as I just shared, this is what we found. Um, a lot of this. These findings can be found. We can bound this up and, and put it in the publication. Um, they can be found on our website, www.firstnations.org. And you can search the Knowledge Center for Reason and Media Truth. These are all publicly available documents. And, and, and again, since this, this research had not been done before, we found it to be pretty foundational. And hopefully, it'll be used going forward by academics and, and community practitioners for years to come. Um, but you know, again, we, we did all this work. We, we did all this research in order to understand the current narrative because what our goal was at the end was to start changing that narrative, right? Um, and, and we really wanna see um, you know, what, what, is, what does the new narrative look like, one that's controlled by Indians? And, and you can see from the slide that you know, the new narrative we seek, seek has some pretty simple components, right? It needs to be flexible, um, it needs to remove stereotypes, and it, it needs to offer a new underlying framework. Um, and, and, and actually it's a little bit more prescriptive, a little bit more building block than that. But you know, one of the important things that we also noted is that any new narrative that we create has to resonate not only with our, our non-native neighbors, but with Native communities themselves. This is equally as important that we find new narratives that 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 kind of you know is a two for a buy one get one free. That we get one that a narrative that works for non-native communities and and for our own communities. And then we need to have that buy-in from our native communities. Um, and at the end of the day, we really want to kind of replace these narratives that are based on a, a, a negative frame and, and create positive frame narratives. For the work that we are trying to do in the communities, and and so you know we we started the, the second part of this project and really of saying you know how do we get native voice in this narrative, this new narrative project? How do we get authentic voice here, and, and create lots of working groups to in, in native constituencies. To help us with this this thinking, it wasn't just you know us First Nations Development Institute sitting in a 
a conference room, we actually held you know a few recent sessions with um, stakeholders from around Indian country and Alaska Native communities to talk about you know what what we found and and how do we how do we how do we make this change or how do we begin this change happening um, for us and among us, right? And, and we really came up with these what we say are kind of four building blocks and. Um, I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly. Um, again, you can all have um, access to the slide deck after the lecture. And, and if, if the Alaska can't get them for you, you can email me here at First Nations. I can get this for you as well, or you can find them in our, our Examinated Truth publications. But in our, our mind, there's four, four primary building blocks. Um, you know, there's, there's a little bit of order of operations here. We think the first two are um kind of want to get they could be either one or two but the, the third and fourth one need to be kind of in that in that in that order um and, and really we what we found was that a new narrative really needs to be to include um some statements about the native values that we are talking about um because in many cases uh, or in, for a couple instances one is um people find native values really resonant people um identify with those and in many cases they're, they're very parallel to broader American values. No surprise there. This country very much lifted and borrowed, borrowed is a nice word, um, native values in the writing of our laws and, and our democracy. So values is a very important part. Um, we I alluded to the to the to earlier about people's desire to have more education. Um, we recognize that there is a, a big vacuum when it comes to, to Native education. So when we write narratives, we're trying to create change and, 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 and convince people of something. We, we recognize that we're going to have to do a little remedial education on the history side for folks to understand why this is important and, and, and create little mini history lessons as, as we do this work. Um, you know, our finding number one, right? Invisibility in the present. Um, Indian people are not visible in contemporary society. We are not seen as everyday characters in people's daily lives. Um, one of the folks in the video said it's 2% of the population. The likelihood of somebody knowing a native person is very low. I think it's a little higher in Alaska, having grown up there. Um, you know, natives are a lot more visible. Um, but, you know, here in the lower 48, um, you know, Think about that. If you know 100 people, um, the odds are two of them will be native. Um, I think that's even lower than that, given the geographic isolation of natives in the lower 48. So visibility is a very big part of what we think needs to be included in the new narrative for native folks. And then kind of the last part for us was those other three pieces, the um, history and the visibility and the values piece are all all great, but if we are we don't do anything with them, if we just let them sit there on their own without asking for active change, then we're really not doing our work. And so we felt that any sort of narrative change work that we do really needs ha, ha, needs to have a very clear call for action. Um, and so those are the three built the four building blocks. Um, again, we think that the visibility one is, you know needs to be preceded by the history and the values ones. And, and again, we, we can mix history first and values second, or values first and history second, but we, we really think the, the next two need to come in order. Um, we, we, we thought that this, you know, we, we started testing this, this concept, this new narrative building block approach. Um, we really wanted to make this, this, this formula you know, work across a broad array of groups and messages in Indian country and Alaska Native communities. And, and it wasn't lost on us that we, we needed to do some testing on this. We needed to actually um, create some, uh, some test narratives and then take them out into public survey settings or public polling settings and say, what did it, how does this work, right? And, and so I have a couple examples here today of the, some of the things that we tried. Um, with this, this new native narrative formulation, right? Um, 
here's the first one. Um, I'm sure many of you know the importance of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, this is the act that ensures that when a child is um, up for adoption, um, that the, the first right of refusal should go to Native families and Native tribes before that child is taken out of its Indian culture and its Indian um, village or community. Um, you know, recently, you, you probably have noticed over the last few years, there were some high profile cases where um, Native kids have been adopted, um, weren't identified, and then the, the news media has been one of Native countries' worst enemies and um, painting Natives in a very unfashionable, unfavorable way um, as being anti against the, the interest of the child itself and being very selfish in their desire to create community continuum and cultural continuum um, and ensuring the, the psychological and spiritual health of, of those children um, and, their, and their ability to stay inside their native communities. Um, in this instance, you know, this is, we did this um, a sample narrative looking at um, the importance of ICWA. Um, one of the people in our um, advisory committee was Sarah Kostelik, who runs the National Indian Child Welfare Association down in Portland. And so we created, with her help, we created this narrative with the, uh, with the new um, building block approach. Again, you see the values, the visibility, a big chunk of history, um, touching on values again, and then a call for action. And um, we were pretty astounded by the results, actually. Um, we, we tried two different approaches. We had a control group who who didn't hear this narrative and told us what they thought about ICWA. And then we had the, the sample group where we, we, we shared this narrative with them and then act, asked them what they thought about ICWA. And you can see here, um, when we didn't share this narrative, um, two, only about two thirds of the folks surveyed, um, you know, two out of three said that they agreed that it was, was important. And one in 10 said, you know, they didn't think it was important. No, they really opposed this idea of um, in the In the second group, those who, the, those who heard the, the, the narrative um, was, was a pretty amazing transformation, right? Um, four in five people who heard the narrative as opposed to two and three, you know, so we, got, we went from, you know, 66, 67% to 80% of the folks were very positive about ICWA. And, and equally as important, the, the people opposing this dropped from 10% to 5%. So instead of one in 10 people opposing this, we now have one in 20 people opposing it. And you look at the difference um, of favorable responses and the drop in of opposition responses, the delta is 17%. That's one in six people, right? That's a, that's a pretty big number if you're, if you're trying to make um, change hearts and minds. And so we were, we were very excited about this, but it realized that we needed to, to create data, not just a singular data point. And so we, we, tried, a, we tried a second approach. And, and I, will, I will share that um, we, were, uh, we were told by our, our, our public polling folks that when they first did, the, when they did their first poll, they came back and said, the, uh, the mascot issue is so high voltage that you need to stay away from it, right? That that you know this is a this is a an issue that could be the the tail that wags the dog of this entire project, and that people are on one side or the other, and it, it's it's going to be a tough fight. Um, but then we had a uh, great researcher out of the she was then at the University of Washington. Her name is Stephanie Freiberg. She's now moved on to the lesser institution, University of Michigan, um, said as a true Husky would say. Um, but she was very insistent that we look at the, the mascot issue because she thought there was a lot of room for change and, and that a change needed to happen on this topic. We also had Suzanne Harjo on our advisory board and Suzanne has been the lady who's been leading the charge against the uh, changing the, the name of the Washington football team for almost 40 years now. And so between those two, they said, we need to, we need to find more data on 
the ability to change hearts and minds around the native mascot issue. And, and so here's, here's the example we used um, on the mascot issue as the narrative we've tested. Um, same, same process we used before with ICWA, you know, had some people listen to the narrative and others not and ask them how they felt about the mascot issue. Um, some, some pretty interesting results, right? Um, for folks who didn't hear this narrative prior to giving us their opinion, it was pretty dang evenly split, right? Um, about half the people supported it about half didn't, right? About five percentage points difference. Um, so, you know, it, it really came back and, and demonstrated what our polling folks have said, that this is this is a pretty evenly split issue. And there's a lot more nuance around the mascot issue that you can find in our, our research findings report. I think it's, that's some of the more interesting conversation um, that you'll find there. But then when you looked at the, the folks who heard the narrative and asked them the same question, it was it was it was markedly different, right? That more than half agreed that, that the mascots needed to be changed. I mean that's that's 53% as opposed to what 39, 40% um, previous, right? On the people who didn't hear this narrative. And equally equally as important, we've gone from one in three people opposing it who didn't hear the narrative to only one in four who did, or less than one in four who did. And the delta there was was 25%. So one out of every four people changed their minds, changed their hearts, changed their belief about the mascot issue, having read this building block narrative that we put together. Right? Um, and um, again, I, I think that we, we, we knew that there was kind of this underlying current from my research, especially around millennial women, right? And um, I'll, I'll tell you that when you, when you think about, you know, who's going to be buying products in the near future, there's real companies. Uh, I'll give you an example of Land of Lakes, who really worries about the way in which people view using mascots on, on brands and products, right? And so um, this has real meaning in the marketplace as well. Um, again, we this wasn't an academic exercise for us, right? We, you know, First Nations Development Institute, the, the organization I run and, and work for. Um, is really trying to work to empower native communities throughout the country um, but and, and feel that um, when we do our jobs well we, we put information and tools in the hands of native communities and so all along um, our, our goal was to to create toolboxes and tool sets for native communities to be able to to do this work on their own without without us and and so we created a, a user's guide for native communities to use this narrative research and findings as well as uh, the new model for building blocks um, for native communities. But we also recognize that as 2% of the population, you know, our ability to be heard and, and be seen is, is limited, right? And we really need to have friends and allies amplify our voice and, and our needs. And, and we really need to have um, our allies in this work and we need to give them tools as well. And so we've created a side-by-side -side, um, user's guide for our allies to, to talk about narrative change alongside of us. And, and again, both of these publications can be found at First Nations um, website or Knowledge Center. Um, again, www.firstnations.org um, under Reclaiming Native Truth in the Knowledge Center. So you know, please feel free to find these. They're, they're, you can download them for free. Again, they're intended to be in use, not to be sitting on um, shelves in, in academic libraries. Um, I'm gonna leave a few minutes here for, for questions, but one of the things I wanted to, to leave you with is, is um, this picture here. And um, I, I, I love irony, right? Um, and I think this is one of the most ironic things that, that came about from our narrative changes that you know, as I shared with you earlier, um, natives are, are invisible in contemporary society, right? That just, we're just not seen. Um, and so part of the narrative change work that we're hoping to do is to make natives more visible. Um, and the irony for me is that one of the products of our work was making the Indian on the butter box disappear, become invisible. So um, thank you for listening to me today. Good Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. That was very interesting and, and covered a lot of ground. Um, we do have a few questions. And uh, one of them is, how can native organizations transition from a deficit mindset to a growth and asset-based mindset? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I, I took over my organization about 15 years ago and, and the, the common practice around, as I shared earlier, around native not-for-profits is um, they go looking for money and, and the first thing they do is, is start playing the, the poverty Olympics, right? Like they, they, they share with you what is most messed up about their communities. It's, you know, domestic abuse rates, alcoholism rates, drug use, unemployment. I mean, I'll, I'll show this. I, I spent five years in venture capital where we went to invest in high performing companies. And in the five years I worked there, there is nobody who came to us and said, <laughs> we are the most messed up company in the world you should invest with us, right? Right, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and it strikes me when I come back and, and I read proposals from native communities that, that lead with the deficits of their community. And so, you know, I'm a big believer having grown up in a, in, in a native community. I mean, you know, Kitchenham was a native community, but it was a pretty, it was pretty segregated community. The, the, the neighborhood I grew up in, in, in Park Avenue and Deermont and and uh, and Woodland Avenue, and even as you go out further south from the Saxman, I mean, these, these are mostly natives, or maybe a handful of Filipino folks sprinkled in. But you know, these were highly um, engaged entrepreneurs and, and business people who were who were kind of the, the striving middle class. And so, it, you know, in my mind, I grew up in a, in a magical place. You know, I, I share with people that it wasn't until I got to college in Idaho that I I realized that. Not everybody had an old fridge turned into a smoker in their backyard, but I mean, the, the, the genius of Indian people was around me all the time. And for me to have grown up in an environment where that genius and that entrepreneurial zeal was around you in your everyday life, and then to, to look at on paper how people talk about your community, they were two different communities to me. And, and one that I was proud to be from and be of, um, and, and I think that, you know, when we think about that as Native people, that's the story we should be telling, right? This, this is a story of strength. This is a story of resilience. This is a story of entrepreneurship. This is um, of creativity and survival. Um, those, are, those are pretty strong, positive narratives. And I, mean, I think you can always have as footnotes some of the, the reality on the ground with regard to the deficits. But the, the primary narrative really needs to be this positive mindset of values, of history, about how we got there, about visibility and, and really our desire to change. Another question we have is, today we have natives and Native Americans who do not look native and physically appear to be white or black. They may not look like natives, but culturally identify as native. Mm -hmm. they are, but they are neither accepted by natives or non-natives as being native. How do we change the narrative about native individuals who do not look like natives, mm -hmm. but identify culturally as native? Yeah, you know, I was, uh, so my, my mom's family, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm half white. That's why I do really well in business school. Um, so I always tell people that I have all these bad habits and, and bad value systems. I grew up with a, in a, in a half white household. Um, and I say that, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek. But my, my non-native aunt, I just saw her a couple of weeks ago and she's talking about some of her, her nieces and nephews who don't look native. And, and I, I have to ask the question, what does that mean, right? Um, I know what that, I know what that means. The, 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 what that means is you don't look like the narrative that Hollywood has been talking about as an Indian for so long. We, we don't look Plains, Lakota, Native, right? And, and, in, and uh, the, 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 the person asked the question, you know, name some of the attributes that, you know, we see that don't look Native. They look more white, they look more black. Well, you know, when you, when you talk about Native identity, it, it isn't necessarily a, a color 
that we, we're talking about. We're talking about, a, again, a political entity and a political tribe. And that, you know, historically we didn't have tribal, tribal membership defined by blood quantum. It was about belonging and acceptance, right? And you were, it was pretty binary. You're either part of the tribe of the band or you weren't, right? And that was, it didn't matter if you were, uh, in many cases, you know, of that tribe, whether you're Lakota or you were uh, somebody who married in or was raided into the tribe, you were you were part of that tribe from a political identity. And so I think we needed to we need to change that narrative away from blood quantum and into the political identity that we own. Um, I have two daughters. Um, you know, uh, being half native myself, you know, half I, I I'll use that terminology half blanket myself that makes them one quarter, right? Um, they get the question all the time, you don't look native, right? But I, I, I how, how much Indian are you, right? That's the big question, especially my blonde haired, blue eyed daughter. And the answer she gives is, I am 100% Clinket. I am an enrolled member of the tribe. And my political identity isn't about blood quantum, it's about belonging, it's about this political identity that I own. And I think that's the narrative we need to be sharing and talking about and not a color or a blood quantum definition that's a narrative that's, that's imposed on us by somebody else. And we're getting a lot of good questions. Here's another one. Um, while reclaiming native truth and changing the narratives, how do we support our relatives who hold multiple identities like Alaska Native and Black, Alaska Native and Filipino? That's kind of yeah. extending your this question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's a great question because you know, this 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 question about identity and who de and who defines who you are and and who who controls the narrative about you know what you are and what you are not, right? I mean, I think we've seen over the last four years with the with the with the underlying um, thing that people are trying to say is you're not fully American, right? That you are you are other and you are different and you are lesser than, right? And and that is a narrative that's imposed by mainstream media, mainstream white male media for the most part. Um, and, and so honestly, this while this reclaiming native truth is about um, looking at reclaiming native identity, native narrative, I think the same building blocks are applicable no matter who you are that this idea of values, this idea of visibility, this idea of history, um, and this call for action, work across ethnicities and nationality um, on retaining identity, whether that's native or something else. Okay, another question kind of relates to what you were talking about earlier about the negative presentation of cultures, of native cultures as being a way that most people relate to it. Um, do you think the deficit mindset found in grant language submitted by native organizations stems from the nature of grants and grant funding? Um, you know, I, I, I will say this. I, I think that the, the foundation and government um, grant receiving community has done impoverished communities and communities of color a disfavor um, across the board that that we have asked for these kinds of statistics historically as, as grant making organizations and trained grant writers to write in that fashion but i also know um, you know from having run an organization that is a grant seeker and a grant giver at first nations over 15 years, we have been highly successful in seeking grants, um, more so than many of our, our contemporary um, counterparts um, in Native organizations. And I, I honestly believe it's because we lead with, lead with a positive image. This is a jump on this bandwagon, we're going to do something great here at this organization kind of conversation, not woe is us, we're so pitiful, you, can, you need to give us some money. And I, and I think that the latter, the, 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 the pity part of asking for charity can only get you so much resource that if you really want to build a successful organization and a successful fundraising appeal, 
people want to join winners. I mean, you know, watch watch when the Seahawks are doing well, how many fans they have versus when they're doing poorly. And how many are that's not true. They probably have the same number of fans, but they have a lot more vocal fans when they're winning, right? Um, and, and I think the same is for, for native organizations. When you can demonstrate um, success and speak about your accomplishments as opposed to your deficits, people want to be a part of you. Well, appreciate everything you've said. Uh, we uh, are nearing the end of, um, of things here, but uh, it's been really good to have you, Mr. Roberts. Um, SHI invites viewers to return for our next lecture by Dr. Daly Sambo Doro, entitled International Indigenous Human Rights, an Introduction, which will be broadcast on Monday, November 30th at noon. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take. And uh, this will help us to continue improving our lecture series and also allow our funders to measure the impact of our program. Thank you and see you again on Tuesday.